Rahul Dawa, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Tony Jewell Wales Africa Health Links Annual Lecture. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to introduce the lecture. Very honoured to have a annual lecture in my name. Um, the purpose of these, however, is to give me an opportunity to remain in contact with Welsh colleagues and friends and to keep in touch with how um, Wales and Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, the health links are developing. Uh, over the years, we've had um, a variety of different speakers looking at different topics. Uh, for example, we had David Knott talking about surgery in conflict areas and the remarkable work that he's done to uh, maintain contact and training with surgeons working in very difficult circumstances in the Middle East and in Africa. Then we had um, Professor Michael Marmot talking about global health inequalities, because all of us who've worked in global health are well aware of the problem of health inequalities. I mean, obviously both in the UK, but also across the world and particularly affecting Sub-Saharan Africa. Last year, we had um, Dr. David, Professor David Pension, uh, talking about um, global health and sustainability. And I was delighted uh, that, that David, after his lecture, remained in contact with people in Wales um, and has developed a variety of things. Um, Tom Downs, I think, is now linked to the uh, Bevan Commission. Um, David has been supporting, uh, I don't know, the Welsh government. Um, now, what was it? Um, let's, 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 sorry, I'm a bit like Boris Johnson. I've just uh, lost my speech, but he's... Um, What's it? Wales for for the further the cause of sustainable healthcare, Green Health Wales team, the Welsh Climate Smart Clinical Network, as well as uh, Dr. Tom Downs, who I think is on this afternoon's um, meeting. So, because of COP twenty six and the fact that, as David says, the climate change, the climate emergency is our twenty first century public health priority. It's absolutely appropriate that we've invited um, Professor Anthony Costello this afternoon to talk to us about the future health of our children, uh, thinking that globally. We've invited Anthony to speak for uh, about half an hour and then asked uh, Sophie Howe, Commissioner for Future Generations in Wales, to respond, as well as Mrs. Malopo from Masiru in Lesotho, uh, who will give us sub, sub Saharan Africa response both in um, five minutes and then we'll open up to general questions and answers. And as Claire said, um, if you can be putting your questions and responses in, into the box, we'll be collecting them up and, um, and uh, use them in the final <laughs> discussion. We do hope that this will uh, be finished by six o'clock, uh, ever optimistic. Uh, so I think I'll proceed now with uh, introducing uh, Anthony Costello tonight, who is Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development at the University College London. Uh, he's a Senior Advisor to Children in All Policies 2030. He's Co-Chair of the Lancet Countdown for Climate and Health Action. And he's former Director of the Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health for the WHO, and I'm not going to go into any further about his uh, extensive CV, um, but just to say that he's also um, a co-chair of the Independent Sage during COVID uh, and obviously was editing the Lancet Countdown, which was published just before COP26. Um, so if we're thinking about global health and sustainability, uh, health inequalities and what we can do about it, then there's no one better than uh, Professor Anthony Costello to talk to us about it. So I'd like to welcome you, Anthony, uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Tony. And I'll try and get my screen up. Um, I hope you can see that okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a future for our children question mark. My name's Costello, which often gets mistaken for either being Irish or Italian or occasionally Spanish. But I just wanted to point out, this is a picture of my grandmother when she was 18 and when I knew her. 
And her name was Amy Morris. And her father was a Welshman from the Southern Welsh Valleys. And she was the youngest of six children. And two years after she was born, uh, her father, William Morris, legged it back to Wales with a traveling dancer. And she never saw him again. Well, that's as maybe, but genetically, I think it proves that I'm more Welsh than Irish or Italian. So I've burnished my credentials for this talk. Um, first question, is everything getting better? Um, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and people, well, Bill Gates edited a version of the Time magazine, and he always calls himself an impatient optimist and very much argues that, you know, using Hans Rosling's data, which I'm sure many of you have seen, things are generally getting better around the world. It's never been a better time to be a child. And certainly the evidence that is there supports that. I, I mean, we've seen a, a very dramatic fall in all income countries in child mortality since 1960. And there are others that also share this kind of uh, viewpoint. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg says a brave new fast moving porous world where large institutions are about as useful as dinosaurs. We don't need WHO, the World Trade Organization. Basically the corporate world, philanthropic capitalism will solve everything. Now there's um, an alternative view to that. Um, and this, this is put by uh, Mark Mazowa, who's a historian and political scientist. And he argues that actually our children's world is weakened, that the financial crisis, and he wrote this nine years ago, rising inequality, welfare net slashed, black market smuggling, rigged elections and corruption in many countries, disaffected electorates, and no coordinated response to climate change. And he said voters around the world still see their primary allegiance to their national state rather than any larger polity, which has been borne out, I think, by America first, the Brexit vote, and you could argue the COVID response. I'll come back to that. So I did work for one of these wicked organizations for three years, the World Health Organization. And I went there quite late in my career in 2015. And on the day I got there, I was sitting in the cafe where I did most of my business subsequently, because you meet everyone. Um, and I met this guy on the left, Andrew Castles, who is a British diplomat who'd been there for uh, about 30 years. And he said, hi, Tony, I'm glad you're here. And he said, do you know how many people work at the World Health Organization? And I said, no. And he said about half, which I thought was quite funny, actually. But um, I thought, oh, my goodness, what have I let myself in for? Is this going to be a terrible bureaucracy? And of course, it is a bureaucracy, but no worse than most others I've worked in. Uh, but actually, my team there were working incredibly hard. And I, I do try to defend uh, WHO, even though I wrote in the last month an essay in the British Medical Journal that we needed to defend WHO. And currently, it's not fit for purpose, in my view, because if you look below in the orange lines, uh, that is a thousand million dollars, which hasn't changed in 25 years. The assessed contributions from member states, that's about 40% of my university's budget. So WHO has to depend increasingly on gifts and assessed contributions. And I think that's no way to run a global health agency when we've been through a pandemic, which has cost the world in excess of $30 trillion. Now, another issue, this is maternal mortality, the x-axis, versus caesarean section. And the red line is what WHO suggests as the probably norm for a country, that there should be about 15% uh, having a uh, caesarean section at the time of birth to deal with complications. And you can see that the poorer countries of the world uh, generally have much lower levels than that. India may have changed since this slide was done. Uh, and, but generally speaking, they're getting too little, too late access to cesarean sections, and the pandemic has made it worse. 
But above the line, we're finding that many women are being uh, operated on unnecessarily. And even if you look at Bangladesh, it looks pretty good at 20 uh, percent cesarean. Well, 70 percent of people in that country deliver at home still. And those that go to hospital, I think the cesarean section rate is above 60 percent. So we have a big issue in the world that it's very unequal, but both rich and poor are often inappropriately treated. And we can see this absolutely with the current data on vaccination uh, and the vaccine apartheid that has been created across the world, where high and mid upper middle income countries are fine and you go down to the low income countries and you've got literally two or three percent fully vaccinated. And this, in my view, is a scandal, and it's a scandal brought about by the capture of a public good like the COVID vaccine by um, both pharmaceutical companies and wealthy countries who are protecting them, and they're not sharing their technology or agreeing to a patent waiver. We can talk about that in the discussion. And if we look at the state of undernourished people in the world, we can see clearly that it's remained pretty flat for the last 10 to 15 years uh, around, you know, getting up to six, 700 million people facing hunger. But actually, it's gone up quite steeply in the last year because of presumably the pandemic. Um, an additional 6.7 million children under five will suffer wasting this year due to COVID-19 because of the disruption to the economy, to travel, to access to healthcare. That's according to UNICEF. And a paper in Nature, Nature Food, calculated the productivity losses due to the, all these uh, additional uh, cases under different scenarios, pessimistic, moderate, or optimistic, as being, you know, for some of them in excess of um, 34 billion uh, dollars. I, I don't like quantifying death and disease in terms of money, but that's a, a human capital way of measuring it. Um, now, I'd like to come on to climate change because, you know, I knew very little about climate change until about 2007. I went to a meeting at the Royal College of Physicians and heard the scary stuff coming from meteorologists and the like. And a week later, Richard Horton from The Lancet rang me up and said, could the new Institute for Global Health at UCL uh, do a commission on this? He wanted to have some, uh, it was the first commission. And we had no money and I spent two years going around the university meeting people from every other faculty, geography, economics, maths, law, philosophy. And we came up with a report that said, you know, climate change is the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. And it got a lot of media attention and, Nothing much happened after that. And we got a lot of skepticism. There are a lot of people who still felt global warming was a bit of a myth. Just 12 years later, we're now, um, and we, we did another commission five years later, and then we decided to set up a, a countdown process and we produce annual reports. And the changes since then have been faster than we expected. And, you know, to some extent, we're in a degree of crisis now, and I think very few people would be skeptical. So this year's report, the summary was we're at code red for a healthy future, uh, which echoes the um, IPCC's finding of code red for the planet. And we know that climate change amplifies world inequalities. So at the top, you see the distorted world map by carbon, carbon pollution, whereas the victims of carbon pollution and death rates generally are in the lower distorted map. Now, just to, I mean, you can download that report. It's for free. It's quite long. There's a lot of fascinating data that we collect on 41 indicators. Here's a few examples. So we know that there's been a sharp increase in um, vulnerability to uh, exposure to heat waves in just the last 10 years. And we all know that there have been extreme heat events happening uh, in places like Siberia, where, you know, there were wildfires that covered the, the size of 
Belgium times six. So, I mean, strange things are happening and the amount of heat that the world has gained has actually doubled over the last 15 years, according to a nature study. Um, and we are seeing concomitantly a big increase in wildfires. In fact, in Southern Africa, I'll be interested when um, uh, Madame Malapo talks to us about um, uh, uh, Lesotho, because I'd be interested to know if they're having this. But we know this is a growing problem with 72% uh, of countries showing increased exposure. And we also know that this could be compounded by the fact that top right, you can see that the crop yield potential for various crops is steadily falling because of heat and shorter growing seasons. We're seeing uh, problems with water security from Cape Town through Somalia, Kenya and the like. And drought events seem to be going up very steeply over the past 10 years with now 19% of the global land surface affected by extreme drought. And that's more than doubled in 15 years. And this is a picture of the Sutu that I got, which is, you know, being disproportionately affected by climate change. There are novel um, approaches to subsistence agriculture there. I believe I'm right that only 11% of Lesotho's land is actually um, a cultivable. Um, and the big question for them is what compensation are they getting for loss and damage? arising from climate change, which is being caused from the north. And the Glasgow COP did not address that issue. And we know that, um, you know, considering the trillions of dollars, 25 trillion put into the world economy, said the Prime Minister of Barbados to prop up stock markets, yet we couldn't come up with 100 billion to pay countries like Lesotho and others. And water and sanitation is not on track. The climate crisis is in many ways a water crisis. And of course, water is essential in preventing the spread of infection like COVID-19. Um, and if you look at access to toilets around the world, I mean, many more people have mobile phones than toilets or functioning toilets. Um, if you look at a country like India, they have actually built 90 million toilets in the last 10 years. But that doesn't altogether stop open defecation. You can see in the lower chart that although the purple are in uh, from 2006 down to the orange 2016, but many northern states still have really quite high levels of open defecation. And of course, it's not just about having a toilet. Uh, you may have a toilet and you put other things in it rather than going to it. So uh, that's a complex cultural issue as well. This is a appalling statistic. More than 90% of the world's children breathe toxic air. In many of the, uh, you know, I first went to Kathmandu in 1984 when most people were cycling or on rickshaws and it was a really nice place and I cycled. Now, I mean, in any South Asian city, it's unbelievably awful at this time of year. But even in London, and I'm sure in Cardiff, we don't always have the safest air and particularly in vulnerable hotspots. And this is what's the cause of it. We're seeing carbon dioxide rising relentlessly. Uh, when it was 300 when I was born, it's now 420 near it. And look at what's happened in response to conferences, uh, protocols, accords, and agreements. The answer is actually nothing. We haven't managed to arrest this in any way. So we're facing a crisis and one that politicians seem unable to uh, galvanize support for. And I won't go into this really, except to say that um, we're gonna pass 1.5 degrees by uh, the end of this decade, almost certainly. The pledges, if they were all fulfilled, might keep us to 2.1 degrees, but actually at the very least, we're heading up to 2.7 degrees right now. And that is potentially catastrophic for the world. Um, and the health benefits of ambitious decarbonisation are clear to see because it could prevent millions of deaths each year from reduced air pollution. We could have improved diets. We could have increased physical activity. We got a glimpse of this during the pandemic. I was actually 
up in Yorkshire. My wife's from Yorkshire and, and we were, or I was trapped up there, if you like, for about four or five months during the first lockdown. And it was actually really pleasant because I could go out for walks, clear blue sky, bird soul and all the rest. So, you know, we forget that a clean environment is absolutely critical and critical for our children. So what can we do? Well, before I left WHO, we set up a higher level commission chaired by Helen Clark, former prime minister of New Zealand, our Colset, minister of state from Senegal. And we worked for two and a half years on this, thinking about what can we do about the future and what are the key, you know, some really key principles that go beyond the traditional stuff of less diarrhea, pneumonia, malaria and the like. And we had 41 commissioners from around the world. And another Lancet pr production came out last year in February 2020. And I'd like you to download that because you can read the executive summary rather than the whole thing. Um, and the basic principle is that child health is in every ministry. We need protection from every sector. So transport, road injury is the leading cause of death for children and young people above five. Agriculture and trade, essential for nutrition, urban planning for play, environmental policies for air pollution and all the effects that has through our life course. And of course, setting up a lot of problems in many parts of the world for when they're much older. And of course, family services. Helen Clark was very strong on housing. 40% of children in the world live in informal settlements. And of course, education is essential. And of course, many children are going to school now who didn't 15 years ago, but it's also the quality of education and whether they're actually gaining uh, skills and literacy and numeracy. And progress on child-related SDGs, frankly, has stalled. Many children are in countries affected by fragility, by conflict, and actually, most countries are not reporting data on the SDG indicators that we agreed in 2015. So we decided after that report, we needed to do something about this. So we um, managed to get some funding from the Children's Investment Fund. And in January this year, we decided to start something which we call Children in All Policies to get some examples of how we can make a difference. And I'll just um, give you a taster of what we've been doing and how we hope this will develop as a, a catalyst for countries. It has to be country-led. That's our basic principle. So the first is that women and children must be placed at the centre of both climate change and the sustainable development goals. Um, there is a financing gap. We need to increase funding into particularly low-income countries. But there's a huge cost if we don't do this. And I'll just show you this slide, which is a summary of the work of James Heckman, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, who showed that basically the earlier you intervene preconceptually or prenatally uh, to improve quality of life for and nutrition for women and infants, you get a tremendous return on your investment. And our Cole Set kept saying she'd been in the cabinet for 10 years in Senegal. And she said it took her that time to persuade colleagues that they shouldn't be drilling for oil. The real thing they should be doing is investing in children, because that's what Korea, South Korea and many other, you know, emerging economies did and are now showing huge benefits. Now, this looks very boring, unified multi-sectoral action, but getting people to talk across ministries, in my experience, is very difficult. And the best place to do it is in cabinet. So to move these issues up into cabinet or move them down to district level where people are often working in similar spaces and obviously right down to community level. So thinking about that, we said to our nine initial country partners who volunteered to come on board, what would you like to do that's cross-sectoral? And uh, so Argentina, Raul Mercer, who's a, a, an excellent pediatrician said, I want to set up a Latin American network on children's rights. So he's galvanized an interest from a whole number of countries in South America, and they're working on that right now, based out of his university. In Ghana, they focused on early childhood development, but they did something very interesting. Um, they set up a national conference with ministers, politicians, and children 
to look at ways in which they could support uh, initiatives. Uh, and they even had a competition where they had to come up with children's ideas about policies that they could do. And I think this is something that we should be replicating in all the countries we work in. I think that's an interesting thing to do. In South Africa, um, during COVID, there was a prohibition because they wanted to free up hospital beds, prohibition of alcohol. Um, they wanted to free up hospital beds for COVID patients. And it had a big impact, they felt, on child health, domestic violence and the like. And now they're looking in some depth at what the policy implications of that are, something I really support. In Nepal, which is a country I did live in for a few years and been visiting for 35 years, um, we're working with adolescents on using them creatively to use mobile phones and citizen science to collect information on their own environment and help them to then have participatory interaction with community farmers, leaders, teachers to tackle issues like landslides, which are a big issue right now in Nepal. Um, and, you know, I've spent 20 years, I'm not going into this, but doing research on participatory action through women's groups in Nepal, Bangladesh, India, and indeed in Malawi. This was a big festival held in Malawi just, uh, just a few years ago where, um, you know, the result of 10 years of doing women's groups, which, where we show big reductions in newborn mortality rates, simply by them getting together, coming up with their own participatory strategies. Uh, 2,000 women assembled that were involved in this. And the local politician who was a minister came along to that meeting. And so I think this is extremely important in getting people, and this applies to Wales, to UK, we need community engagement. We need people to get together to think of ways to tackle problems. And in Pacific Islands, we've got in, um, a group there wanting to work with indigenous peoples, also using the, the principle of citizen science and uh, what Nepal are doing, and we're linking those together. We're working with urban planners in India on how to make low cost housing more child friendly. Um, there's some early work in France on mental health of adolescents in Senegal and social protection for very vulnerable children. And it's interesting because the French partners have already set up with uh, some assistance, a youth council, which they've got from all over the world. But I think this has to be replicated at country level or even lower than that, where you get the voices of children, not just from elite groups, but from all representative parts of the population. Now, the third thing that we came out with in our report was act on climate now. Uh, this, when I was in COP, I got this picture of a little girl carrying a banner saying, I'm very worried. <laughs> and she has every right to be worried. You know, we have to get emissions down. You know, we've had 30 years to act on this and done very little, actually. And now there's a great urgency. And our house is on fire as you know, uh, Greta Thunberg has told us, and we all agree. That's a picture of Australia, by the way, where wild, wildfires were driving people into the sea. So, I mean, this is not every region of the world's being affected. And I'm just going to quickly go over this because you know this, and David Pension gave it to you last year. But this is about action by government, by corporations, organizations, and companies and individuals. And this is not a cost, this is an investment. It could save the world trillions and trillions of dollars. And I'm just, I'm sure you've had lists like this given to you before for government, renewable energy, get rid of fossil fuel subsidies, active and public transport, carbon neutral buildings. We've got to reforest. I mean, we're one of the most deforested countries in the world compared to a thousand years ago. Recycle. Sustainable agriculture, incredibly important, especially for a country like Wales or the Sutu, plant-based diets, green business. And for organizations like hospitals, universities, what are your reduction targets? Are you 100% renewable yet? Get your workers engaged just as we need communities. Can you make buildings carbon neutral? Can you offset? Can you lobby government? And can you innovate for green uh, issues and and my university UCL is doing quite a lot I'm sure 
Cardiff is doing the same. And then finally, individuals, you know, we've got to talk about it. We've got to get the massive, you know, when I tweet about COVID, I get masses of retweets. If I tweet about climate, I only get a handful. And it kind of brings home to me that we've got to get people thinking hard about really how they're going to change consumption, move towards a, a kind of different lifestyle, because otherwise we're setting our children up for a very difficult future. And just moving on, measuring, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I've got about three or four minutes. So measure and ranking country progress. What we did in the report was have the usual measures, SDG indicators with kind of Norway, Japan at the top and Chad at the bottom on child flourishing. But then we also turned it on its head and said, which countries are damaging our children's future through carbon emissions? And it was the other way around. And so we're all in this together. In some ways, wealthy countries are the bigger problem, as we know. And one thing we need, I, I, at Glasgow, a policymaker from Britain stood up and said, actually, during COVID, none of us read academic papers. We're just in, we, you know, we haven't got time for that. We just need dashboards. We need some easy ways of thinking about what we're going to do. And so we've spent the last year with UNICEF and WHO, people we knew before, but getting them together developing a single page kind of dashboard that summarizes for each country how they're doing on various indicators, not to one month, one to 11, et cetera, et cetera. And we hope to launch that in the next couple of months where you, know, you get a green if you're doing okay, red if you're not, yellow, et cetera. And, and for a lot of it, will, it will be gray because there's no data. But that may, we want to then investigate whether that kind of color coding sitting on the minister's desk will actually uh, help them to focus where they should improve. Finally, protection from commercial marketing. And how do we protect children, not just from the old things of tobacco, alcohol, formula, milk, but sugar sweetened be beverages, the huge rise in gambling, and most of all, the dramatic change in advertising over the last 10 years through social media, data-driven marketing, algorithms, and the confiscation of children's privacy by using their personal data. And one thing we recommended was we needed to add an optional protocol on this to the UN Convention on Rights of the Child. And we know that breastfeeding rocks, but we also know that it's falling dramatically uh, in many parts of the world. It's the lowest it's ever been in human uh, civilization. Um, we know it could save a lot of lives, uh, stop diabetes, but you're up against a $60 billion industry. Uh, you're up against uh, milk companies that almost universally break the WHO code with impunity. Um, you're up against a massive food industry, which uh, has an absolute plethora of brands, which are encouraging a pandemic of child obesity. We've seen a doubling or trebling of those levels over the past 20, 30 years in the UK, but also in many parts of the world, including low income settings. Um, and I've been sitting in a meeting for the last two days on this issue. Um, food marketing is all about fun and color. And you look at the countries where they've done studies and almost all of them are firing ads in 40 times a day at your children and mine uh, with um, products that are not recommended for marketing to children. What do we do about it? And I'm going to finish by saying, well, when I was at WHO in 2017, there was an attempt to address the global obesity crisis. Uh, and there was a plan put forward, which everyone seemed to be happy with. And in the big meeting that I was sitting in, it was clear that a couple of countries were quite angry about this and were picking fights. And so the chair said, go into another room and sort it out, would you? So we went into another room and we spent five hours going over every wording in the document. And of course, you need everyone to support it to get it endorsed. And I won't name countries. I think you can see one there. And the other one was Italy, interestingly, and they blocked it. They didn't want this to go ahead because of jeopardizing marketing, basically. And we went back into the main hall and I was there, the director of 
mother and child health. And because um, no one was around, they asked me to summarize what had been decided that they would welcome, but not endorse this, this for the whole world, a really sensible set of proposals. So I went up and I grabbed the director general's chair because I wanted a picture for my grandchildren, if I ever have any, and um, gave a short pithy summary for about three or four minutes. And this wasn't very popular because at the end, an American guy came up to me and said, uh, Dr. Costello, I, I found your tone actually rather patronizing. So I said, well, actually, it's pronounced patronizing and it means speaking down to people. And um, anyway, but actually, I didn't say that. That's what I wanted to say. But um, it just brought home to me the politics of the global health that there are lots of countries out there that will block measures. The Americans, the Europeans blocked the stuff on formula market, uh, formula milk um, uh, marketing. And so, you know, and we're seeing exactly the same with, with climate change and with COVID vaccines. We live in a, a nasty political world and we have to do something about it. Uh, so we are in an age of surveillance capitalism Gambling rates are going up very steeply in the UK because every sports event has gambling ads all over it. And gambling, my son's a psychiatrist. He says it's one of the most difficult things to treat and it's devastating. And actually, I have an aunt and an uncle, both of whom were inveterate gamblers. Um, and I'm just delighted that Wales has come up with, in my view, one of the most innovative appointments uh, pioneering, I would say, a future generations commissioner, uh, Sophie Howe, is with us today, and I'm very flattered that you've come along. And I think this is incredibly important. I saw her tweet a couple of days ago, um, and of course I'm fluent in Welsh, but I have got for those that aren't. And, it, and uh, talking about a universal basic income, something that I completely agree with. And I do hope that I can persuade Sophie to get on board with children in all policies. We would love to have her advising us and I'll set up something later with you. But I want to finish by thanking you. It's a great privilege to come and talk to Wales um, and in Africa. I spent my whole childhood coming every year to Wales on holiday in, in South Wales, North Wales, and I love the place. And uh, But do keep in touch with CAP 2030 and with the Lancet Countdown. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, excellent talk, huge range, uh, really relevant and important issues discussed. Uh, I think we've got time for just a couple of quick questions that have been raised. And I know, you know, your <coughs> book you published, The Social Edge, uh, The Power of Sympathy Groups. Um, so you will probably, you know, respond to this question from Catherine Thomas. There's so much evidence that a more collaborative and inclusive leadership is better for the goals you're describing, but we still place value on a more macho, individualistic leadership. How do we change this? And how do we make the case for countries you engage with? So would you like to respond? To um, yeah, I mean, that's a very, very good question. It's, it requires a very big answer. Um, you know, we do, historically, going back to the origins of humanity, uh, our innovation has derived from groups. You know, we hunted in groups, we gathered in groups, we farm in groups, we, you know, credit groups, theatre groups, music groups, sports groups, you know, and, and that's the natural way. The small group is very, well, anyway, I won't go into everything I wrote in my book. One thing I would suggest is that we get women into more positions of power. Um, you know, I, I think there is a transition, um, you know, I think finance and, and stock markets are very male dominated, and that's uh, uh, terrible. Uh, generally, it was said, said to me once, women tend to like working in circles and men working ladders, you know, and, and I do think having more women in politics, I'm not saying all women are perfect or anything like that, and all men are bad, but I think having gender balance in all institutions would make a big, big difference to the way we operate. And I think use of groups should be greatly encouraged and there are ways we could do that. Thank you. Um, and just another quick point that probably doesn't need a huge um, response. And it's really saying in Wales, there's an opportunity 
through the public service boards to try and get this multi-sectoral engagement in uh, health and well-being uh, in Wales. Uh, and you mentioned the problem with, you know, baby foods and so on, and how you challenge commercial for profit interests. And that is actually quite difficult for governments. It has to be an international thing. And the difficulty you highlighted uh, illustrates that. But just flag the fact that in Wales, just like there's a commissioner for future generations, there's also public service boards that uh, should be a vehicle for engaging the NHS more thoroughly in these wider determinants debates. So look, I'm, I've got an eye on the clock. I know Sophie's got to get away by six. So I'd like to just thank Anthony again, and we'll come back at the end for a wider Q&A. Uh, and I'd just like to welcome Sophie Howe, who's Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Most of the audience will be very familiar with her work, but she has a remit set out in law to be the guardian of the interests of future generations in Wales. So it's absolutely appropriate that we've invited her to respond to Anthony's talk about, you know, a future for the world's children. And um, Sophie's role is to provide advice to the government and other public bodies in Wales on delivering social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being uh, for present and future generations. So Sophie, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And um, your five minutes starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And um, thank you, Anthony. That was absolutely fascinating. A whirlwind um, tour of all of the key issues affecting um, children, young people um, across the globe. So the, um, the pleasure really is all mine to have, um, to have heard that. I think that um, what I really sort of took from that is that the key um, things that you were talking about throughout all of your data and all of your examples are really um, the principles which are enshrined um, in our Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So you talked about the, um, the fact that participatory strategies in Malawi were reducing um, deaths in, um, in childbirth and, and reducing um, deaths of infants. Um, here in Wales, involved Involving citizens in a different way during COVID um, has led to an increase in people feeling that there's a sense of community in their area from 52% to 74%. Um, why is that so important? Well, I don't need to tell um, you as um, a, a WHO expert, but the WHO report, which talks about the differences or what the key factors in terms of differences in life expectancy, about 19% of that is to do with social connection um, and uh, you know a sense of community and the, the quality of your relationships. So when we can intervene in a way which brings people together and enables them to find their own solutions, um, which is required by that principle in the Future Generations Act to involve those who have an interest in achieving the goals, I think we might get much better results. The other points that you were making is that everything's connected to everything. Um, and I think for too long, um, most of our kind of approaches of governance and of public policy making um, across the world have not really recognised um, that. And again, through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, that is something that we're trying to change. So whether that's the connection between what we do here in Wales and the impact that that has um, in other parts of the world, the poorer parts of the world, whether that's the connection between um, the, the different policy areas, all of those are critical. So we can see that our actions here in Wales, you know, we have a long history in terms of being a carbon intensive country. The first million pound check for coal um, was signed um, just down the road in, um, in Cardiff. Um, and so we have that sort of um, debt to pay back to those countries who have suffered the most and are continuing to suffer the most um, from some of our actions. But it also plays out at a kind of um, a local level here, because where is the predominantly white countries who have done the majority of the damage and the predominantly black countries um, who are experiencing um, the results of that? Here in the UK, um, if you live in a black Asian minority ethnic community, you're more likely to be living in areas of high air pollution. You're less likely to have access to nature. Um, you're um, less likely to be able to take advantage of the potential 60,000 jobs in the green economy that could be generated unless we have some really um, purposeful interventions. So this is about kind of seeing um, these connections between different policy areas. And I'm really pleased that you 
referenced the uh, campaign around a universal basic income, because back to that World Health Organization data around life expectancy, we know that 35% of what makes a difference in terms of that life expectancy gap is about um, income security. Um, and a universal basic income um, in Wales could, at, and I've modeled two different levels, um, but, at, but at one level, which would cost about seven billion pounds, could um, cut child poverty by 64%, um, could halve overall poverty. And, you know, the simple maths of that, when we think about poverty um, costing overall about £38 billion in the UK, about £29 billion to the health system alone, um, the fact that somehow during the pandemic we found about £380 billion down the back of the sofa um, in a crisis, in an emergency, and yet we've not been able to find that many to prevent those intergenerational cycles of poverty and those ongoing costs. So again, coming back to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, that's exactly where we're trying to get to, where we're re recognising that we need to shift resources um, away from just responding to the emergency towards responding um, right up front, getting up front of a problem and preventing problems from occurring or getting worse. And of course, um, one of those huge problems is the climate. And I want to also talk about the nature emergency because um, they are completely um, intertwined. Um, I've been reading about some of the challenges in Malawi um, and evidence suggesting that um, there's an increase in young girls being married off um, uh, very young because their fathers can't um, afford to, can't feed them because of the quality um, of the land. And when we look at the kind of ecological challenges that we have there, biodiversity loss, the degradation of soil um, and so on, it means that everything that we're eating and growing um, is less nutritious um, than it previously was. And just playing that out um, through rice, for example, and the decrease in protein through rice, through that um, damage that we've done um, to our ecosystems could result in about 600 million people um, being protein deficient. So again, it's those connections between the things we're doing over here and how they play out over there. So I know that I've only got five minutes to um, respond. I'm going to wrap up. There's, you know, I think that we've got a framework here in Wales that the rest of the world can follow. Um, I don't think that we're implementing it um, perfectly. And no doubt you will have seen the many challenges that I've levied um, to government on that. But we are punching above our weight, I believe. And we are the Future Generations Act is driving us to do completely different things. And I think a lot of the focus has been over the past couple of weeks, and let's hope long may it continue, on the deal or no deal in COP and the commitments and you know whether those commitments are going to actually be actioned. But the big challenge for all nations is that when all of those world leaders have returned from Glasgow, they are returning to a system of governance, which is short term, which discounts the interests of future generations and often discounts the interests of those in other parts of the world. That's the sort of framework that the Future Generations Act is trying to get to. And that's the sort of framework which I think if adopted in every country in the world um, would mean that we wouldn't all have to have been in Glasgow talking about the climate emergency in the first place. Thank you very much, Sophie, for that. Um, and so, as you say, small nations uh, can make a distinctive contribution. And I, I think the Welsh government's joined BOGAR, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, for example, uh, so Wales, where the crucible of the Industrial Revolution, if you like, coal and iron and steel uh, is actually leading the way in terms of sustainable futures. Um, and I think Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, it's a fantastic demonstration of intent. And talking of small countries, I'd like to now introduce uh, Mumapeng Molapo from uh, Lesotho. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, head of department to the Lesotho, Lesotho government, are responsible for learner welfare and support. And um, we were put in contact with you through uh, Dolan Kumri, which is one of our oldest health links with Lesotho. And Lesotho, obviously a small country, shares many characteristics as Wales. And um, I gather you've been working with a WCBA funded project on well-being uh, of children. So welcome and I'm very interested to hear your reflections on Anthony's talk. Over to you. Uh, 
have to unmute unmute yourself it's, it's a oh okay thank you very much for me being part of this panel and um the the, the presentation was very informative and enlightening and thank you very much um coming from lesotho which is um surrounded by south africa i think we it's similar to wales in a way but um when we address the issues of uh, the improvement and the threats of child health, um, first, as a country, we are signatory to the ESA commitment, which is the Eastern and Southern African uh, commitment that was in 2013. Uh, the reason why this came about was the fact that it was obvious that the health of adolescents and young people was um, depreciating, they, 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 they had challenges. So in essence, the, the commitment uh, underlines that uh, the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education should work together to link uh, the hospitals and clinics or in health facilities with schools so that learners access friendly health services, and also again gain quality education. So Lesotho is signatory to that agreement. And then we are also going to be signing again because the, the, the agreement that was signed in 2013 came to an end in 2020. So tomorrow there will be a, a meeting that we will be signing another new agreement extending the one that we signed in essence, we have to link education and health so that adolescents and young people access uh, friendly health services so as to improve their, the quality of their health. And then in the Ministry of Education, we are using the child-friendly concept that has uh, seven pillars and then what, what we are implementing is that um, <clears throat> the child-friendly school concept, which was founded on principles of child rights as expressed in the Convention of the Rights of the Child, that is where we are promoting the child-friendly schools con concept countywide in all schools. In essence, we are trying to balance what they eat, how they access that, and also with their health. The initiative is promoting the realization of children's rights to quality education and health. We are implementing this concept as it is holistic and child-centered, inclusive, participatory, multidimensional, and flexible. The standards that are implemented in schools have been organized within the seven child-friendly pillars. So it's through that that we ended up having what is we, uh, a policy the school health and nutrition policy, where all the line ministries and partners that are implementing health-related interventions are, are, are offering quality health to learners while we're also maintaining quality education too. Now with the issue of climate change, yes, through the presentation I saw, <laughs> my country where, you know, the, 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 where there was no grass, it was dry. Yes, climate change has created a challenge really, because now as I'm speaking, it's no longer easy to determine when are we having winter? When is it time to plant crops? Because when it gets dry, it gets dry. When we have rain, there's flooding. So we, are in, we end up having to go into schools try to support learners to have greenhouses and teach them the method of planting, uh, maybe in rockeries that are made in schools so that at least they have crops to grow. Other than that, it's the, 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 the weather has changed dramatically. It's no longer easy to plant during the planting season because it has really gone very bad. Whether it's across South Africa or it's in Lesotho, we have a similar challenge. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to address this as uh, Professor was 
talking about the climate change issues that we are experiencing in our country. And then the crop yield is really falling in Lesotho. And then we are trying to find means in schools to educate learners on how to survive in the far to reach areas, in the rural areas of Lesotho. Water again is also a challenge because uh, wells are drying up. So we have to find a way to maybe let us learn how to find a way around because now it comes too dry and then when it rains, then there are floods. So we have greenhouses and also means of how to deal with the challenges that are brought about by climate change. Uh, learners have had uh, sessions where they, they work together as learners to find ways on how to tackle the climate change issue, how to deal with recycling objects, just, uh, finding ways not to burn things other than burning them, how to recycle them and use within the school uh, facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, for that. I'm, I'm very conscious that um, Sophie's gonna be leaving us in, in about a minute or so. Yes, that's, I was, uh, that's yeah. how I was looking at the time. Yes, no, no worries. Um, Thank you. Was there anything, Sophie, inviting you to, um, you've had, probably had a quick look in the chat column. Is, is there anything that you wanted to respond to in terms of what you've just heard? before you bid farewell and we carry on for just a little bit longer. Sorry, I'm just, um, I'm just looking at them now. Uh, uh, well, well, one was a totally complimentary, you know, fantastic Sophie, Howe, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and and then, then there was one about green spaces. Green space, yeah, I, I, can, um, I can try and pick up on that one if, um, if that's helpful. Um, I think it's, I mean, I can't comment on individual um, sort of circumstances. Um, Planning Policy Wales has been um, reformed um, to align with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, and um, there are specific requirements in that um, around green spaces and around planning um, applications, having to demonstrate how they're enhancing or maintaining um, biodiversity, which is linked to the, the goal of a resilient Wales. So, um, you know, that is the system that has to be um, applied. Um, I completely appreciate that. And, you know, there's there's one very live issue um, at the moment, the Northern Meadows um, in Whitchurch, which is a stone's throw away from um, my house so I um, specifically can't comment on that because I've had to um, declare an interest but I do understand the um, frustrations um, with um, you know that people are feeling in terms of so how is the planning system allowing this to to happen I think my reflections on this is that the policies um, are probably um, pretty good I think the application is um, probably not where it needs to be and I could wax lyrical about why that is one of the um, big challenges I think is capacity in the in the system um, I think there's big challenges around accountability in the system um, and I think there's big challenges in terms of um, the system being um, stacked in favour of development rather than um, giving opportunities to um, appeal and so on from, uh, you know, from, from, from community members. So, um, as I said, I can't comment on individual ones and, you know, we're working hard. We've been working hard to try and reform the policy. Um, and I think that um, perhaps a future, um, future iteration of a Future Generations Act in Wales would give a commissioner more powers to intervene in these, these areas. Thank you very much, Sophie. And um, as as was said earlier in the conversation this afternoon, um, hopefully you, you and Anthony will remain in touch and see how far you know your role and the work that he undertakes, as well as um, you know elsewhere, can be developed further in the future. So, thank you very much for coming. We'll probably carry on a little bit longer now because I, I sense there are a few more comments, but I'm, I'm you yeah. know very. I appreciate you've got to get off to another meeting. So uh, I just say thank you very much on behalf of every, everyone. Thank you. Right, let's get back to some of the, the, the chat. And I was struck by uh, Mufeng Mulapo's uh, comments about, because I've visited Lesotho a couple of occasions and um, well aware that it's a mountainous country and the Orange River sort of arises from, uh, from Lesotho. But your comment about the drought is drought, and very dry, and then the rain comes, but it washes everything away and just uh, floods 
Um, would you like to just talk a little bit more about the kind of uh, experience that you've had in um, in Lesotho with climate change? Okay, um, what actually happens is that you would find it's dry and then sometimes, you know, the, the head boys would burn the grass and then try to, you know, you burn the grass with the hope that you have something green for the animals. And then after burning the grass, then it rains and it washes all the soil away because now there, there was nothing, there were no roots holding on the, the soil. So it's also a challenge that you find after burning the grass, then the, the area becomes barren, there won't be any grass anymore, and then the soil will have been eroded. So what's, what's happening now, we are trying to go into schools, even into the villages with the head boys, trying to teach them that it's not worthwhile to always be burning grass. And then also try to um, build up across or maybe build trees or maybe uh, try to build uh, where, where, where they, they'll grow some crops, even though it's not very easy because now most of the time it's dry and then it rains. So we are trying to teach them to grow stuff in, in schools. That's why we are trying to help them with their um, greenhouses. They are being assisted by the Minister of Agriculture and then uh, teachers in schools that have been trained on how to manage soil erosion and how to collect water where they can, even if it's through when it's raining, there should be means of collecting water to use it later when there's no rain. So that's what we are trying to enforce in schools to appreciate um, when it rains and find ways on collecting water harvesting, building harvesting tanks around schools so that when there's no rain, then they can use the little water they have in there for the uh, plants that they grow. That's, that's what we are doing. Thank you very much. And um, there's a project in Wales called the Size of Wales Project, tree planting, uh, started um, in an area of Mbali when lots of trees were taken down for coffee growing. And then they got uh, flooding and uh, soil erosion and actually loss of life and, and now planting the, the appropriate trees to, to do exactly what you've just described. So it's called the Size of Wales Project and um, working in Uganda and other countries. Maybe we need to follow that up with you in Lesotho. Uh, look, um, yes, can, I, can, I, can I just add on something? There's a, well, there's a, a project that we are piloting in three schools where learners have taken up themselves to plant veg, uh, fruit trees. They've even named that uh, the orchard in uh, the orchard of peace yes. because now they've decided they're taking it upon themselves that even the papers, you know, when you shred paper, what's well, not useful. They've taken it to mix it and then maybe use it, reuse it. So it's it's through the initiate the initiative of learners that instead of throwing things around they should find a way to recycle. So what we do is to bring people, uh, the community, get the community involved in um, trying to teach these learners the things that they can do. So it's, 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 it's a pilot program, but it seems to be working very well that you don't throw anything away, whether it's plastic, whether it's cans, it's what, it has to be reusable. So it's through the initiative of the learners that they feel they have to own this and make life better for themselves. So we are going to roll that out and Good. spread it to other schools and make it better. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we appreciate you joining us from Lesotho this evening. Um, I'm, I want to sort of bring this to a close now by, by, by 10 past and ask Catherine Thomas in a minute to, to come on uh, to tell us about things like the e-learning uh, modules for global citizenship and health. But I wanted just to give Anthony another chance to uh, come back on some of the Q&A or some of the discussion he's heard. Uh, Anthony, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, some really interesting uh, questions. Paul uh, Myers has asked about anxiety amongst young uh, people. And, and I think that is a big issue. I mean, Bill Clinton once said that there's no limit to what you can achieve if people believe that there's going to be a better future. So simply saying things are going to be terrible isn't really the way to go. I think we have to harness adolescence, uh, particularly in young people's energies, 
into going back to respecting nature and respecting our our uh, ecosystems and, and the way we live our lives. And there's loads that we can do. So, I mean, it's it's quite an exciting agenda as one, of the, but it's gonna be different from what we've done in the past. Jess McQuaid asks about have countries successfully worked in an integrated cross-governmental way? Yeah, I mean, I think there are many examples of where cabinets have worked progressively. Smaller countries tend to be better than larger countries and devolution is important. I mean, if you take India, you know, they're, some of their states are larger than Pakistan, you know. So, I mean, it's a very, uh, you have to devolve power and get people engaged. And in terms of the cost of tackling the climate and nature crisis, um, I agree with you. We, I mean, corporates are important. Banks are important. Financiers are important because there is a shift. And I detected this at Glasgow COP that there is a shift towards realizing now that investing in the green economy is the only way to go. And there is going to be a big shift out of renew, uh, out of um, fossil fuels into renewables. It's going to be messy. There will be resistance and the like. And then there was one other, oh, it's disappeared. There was another question, but um, have I lost it? Um, open, hang on. There was a breastfeeding one that sort of- Ah, uh, one of what's our... there? I missed that. Um, well, just just absolute horror at the reduction over time. Yeah. Uh, you know the impact of commercial advertising and so on. Well, I've been, you know, I've been involved in that as a pediatrician for like thirty five years, and and you know the companies are very very good at breaking the rules without appearing to break them, and um, unfortunately, I mean there are many reasons. You know, w women working, commercial pressures cultural pressures and the like and it is a woman's right to choose how she wants to feed her child but in many countries it's a death sentence if they're if they're using dirty water and not getting the right information and uh, so i i just want people to be not influenced by commercial pressures unfortunately there's impunity um you know if you infringe the who code nothing happens if you break trade rules and you promote drugs uh, to people in a way that is unfair to your competitors, you get a $3 billion fine, which is what happened to GSK when they were breaking the rules and, and effectively bribing uh, some of the people to get to shift towards their drugs rather than others. Uh, and so, you know, if it's affecting the competition in trade markets, then you, you feel the full force of the law. But if it's children dying, nobody cares too much. So I think we've got to raise that. And I think there's a massive issue at the moment with commercial exploitation of children from the very biggest companies, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles and that, who are just harvesting every day, a hundred times a day, information about our children, where they live, They it's not anonymized data. Uh, their tastes, their behaviours, and then targeting advertising at them. And I think that is completely unacceptable. And I think I do detect some moves in America now to try and regulate this. And um, I think that's a really big issue because if children are just going to be targeted to be consumers for the rest of their lives in ways that is unhealthy and uh, damaging to the environment, we need to do something about it. Good. Thank you very much. So I think we ought to um, ask Catherine Thomas to help wind this up and perhaps point some directions where people can make contact with the health links and uh, other work with Public Health Wales and so on. So Catherine, uh, over to you. And, uh, thanks again to the speakers and responders uh, this evening. So Catherine. Thank you, Tony. And, and yet again, it's been a terrific lecture, huge topics <laughs> that you've all covered and given very powerful um, and I have to say quite positive mes messages about what uh, the power of kind of collaboration and inclusiveness and especially through women and children because who cares more about the future than somebody who's young or somebody who's given birth to a child. You know, this, we need to harness that power in any way that we possibly can. And it is powerful, isn't it? A social movement as consumers, as users, as voters. However, we can do things differently. Um, and hopefully we, um, I'm delighted that Memorial Apple is here. And I know we have a strong partnership 
relationship between Wales and Lesotho in many, many different areas, education, health, governance, all sorts, which we really want to, to build on and to go from strength to strength. So we are a network. The Wales Africa Health Links Network is a network. We're trying to be collaborative and, and inclusive. So if people are interested, not already involved, I put some links in the chat. We, if you just Google Wales and Africa Health Links Network, you'll find our website. You can sign up to our bulletin for any information about events like this. We had a conference at the beginning of November and you can you can see all the recordings of, of those sessions there. I've mentioned that there's an e-learning network for any health workers in Wales about global citizenship. So a lot of the things that Sophie was talking about are included in that, you know, how can we act as individuals and within our organizations to be better global citizens? So that's really worthwhile module that to have a look at. Um, and then we've had a couple of reports earlier this year that were commissioned by the Welsh government on global health activity in Wales and, and specifically one about international health partnerships. And I put a link there done with our colleagues in FET, the Tropical Health and Education Trust. And I think Ben was here, I don't know if he's still here, the Chief Exec of FET, who are a fantastic organisation. So if people want to get involved as individuals, have a look at our website, have a look at the FET website. Uh, but Anthony, that was an absolutely inspiring talk. Um, although you laid out all the <laughs> massive challenges, you also have such a kind of uh, a ray of sunshine and, and give us hope. So I'm um, absolutely delighted that you could do our annual lecture this year. And I'm really pleased that, that Tony is still sticking with us. Having moved out of Wales some time ago, you're sticking with us and, um, and managing to get us great speakers uh, every year. So thanks everybody again. So I think Tony, did you have your hand up? You wanted to say something? No, I was trying to find the clap function. <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> so again, um, I think we've answered most of the questions, but but um, if we haven't answered any, Claire's going to pick that up or maybe put them to to Anthony, and we'll we'll send those out to everybody. And I don't know, Anthony, whether you would be happy to share your slides to people who participated this evening. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I more the merrier. That's brilliant. I mean, the recording will be available anyway. Yeah. So people will see them yeah. the, through that, but um, that might be helpful for some people. who. I think you've got a copy, haven't you? So you can make a PDF or something. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. So, um, Claire, can I say thank you to you and the team for doing all the logistics and organising for this? Um, so <laughs> thank you very much. And for Sophie's team for um, uh, helping us to, to put all this together. And Lesotho team, Sharon and Mayor Malapo. So um, I don't know, there's nothing else to, to say unless anybody wants to jump in and, and um, have the last word. But otherwise, thanks everybody for coming and have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you very much from yeah. the Martin Kingdom. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.